Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Good morning, and you're all welcome to this morning's uh, Signpost webinar. Uh, this morning's webinar is brought to you by Chagask in association with uh, Food Drink Ireland Skillnet, National Rural Network, and Dairy Sustainability Ireland. Uh, this morning's uh, webinar is on the, the value of native provenance and uh, hedging stock. And we're joined this morning uh, with, by Joe Gowron. Uh, Joe is uh, uh, CEO of Woodlands for Ireland and by Maria Cullen. Maria is the chair of the Society of Irish uh, Plant Pathologists. You're, you're both welcome. Thank you, Pat. We're also joined by, by Catherine Keena and Catherine has been on the air quite a bit this week. This a webinar is, is the final of a set of six webinars for Hedgerow Week. Catherine, it's been a, a busy and I think very successful set of webinars. Well, I hope so. And I suppose in summary, Pat, we're very fortunate to have a, 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 a network of, of hedges in Ireland, 689,000 kilometres. But what we heard was that quality is not where it could be to deliver biodiversity carbon and all the other ecosystem services from hedges. The theme of this week is understanding hedges better and we have had engagement from over 20 or so individuals and organizations and I suppose Pat what I took from the week was that we all need to work together and maybe most importantly listen to each other because there are so many individual aspects of hedges we all kind of want the same thing but you know there are different angles to it and we really need to listen to everybody's point of view and I suppose that the more we learn about hedgerows, the more we appreciate their, their key role in, in, in the landscape for biodiversity and how they fit with other elements like field margins, etc. Yeah, and I think it's just they're probably their importance is because of their how, how much we have of them. You know, they're on every farm, in every townland, in every parish. And that's the link to the, the, the most common link to nature that both farmers and non-farmers have, I would suggest. Joe, you're uh, jo welcome to the, the webinar this morning. You might give us you, a, a, an idea of your background and, and your interest in, in, the, in the area. Uh, yes, uh, so um, before I came to uh, work full-time at Woodlands of Ireland um, uh, last year, um, I was a woodland management contractor and I specialized in um, the native woodland scheme measures, uh, particularly native woodland conservation and um, establishing new native woodland. But uh, I've also um, was a uh, founder member with the Hedgelaying Association of Ireland and um, did a small amount of, of, of hedgelaying. I, would, I wouldn't be um, a top hedgelayer. Um, but um, I, I understand uh, what's involved with that um, and, and continue to take a keen interest in, in that aspect of hedgerow management. So with, with Woodlands of Ireland, we're looking at certain things to do with seed supply and, and uh, sustainable plant production, not only for hedges, but also for um, the native woodland schemes. Um, so I'll, I'll focus on that uh, aspect in, in the talk. Yeah, and whatever you weren't doing in terms of being out there, you were quite influential in terms of talking about them. Uh, Maria, you're hearing around the country, we hear. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm a geologist by training. I did natural sciences in Trinity College and then did various studies after that. But I've been interested in studying and working on um, a range of fungi, lichenized and non-lichenized fungi in particular. As, and then for the epiphytes in particular, you need to know what substrate they're on. So you needed to know the trees and plants as well. And I think the background in horticulture at home with my dad when I was a child and helping out or being made to help out at times, but really enjoying um, growing and transplanting seedlings and planting them out and learning about names and systematics a little bit um, has really led on to other things, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. Joe, if you're ready to begin your presentation. So uh, the value of native provenance trees and hedging stock and how to reduce health risk to them. Um, so I'm Joe Gowron of Woodlands of Ireland. Um, just a photograph there is actually from the uh, Kildare County Hedgerow Survey by Anya Murray. 
um, I think we go back to 2005 or so, but they, they, so it's, it's showing the link between um, hedges and uh, areas of native woodland and the connectivity in the, um, the landscape. So a Woodlands of Ireland is a charity which was founded in 1998 and connected at that time with the People's Millennium Forest Project uh, with the Millennium. And the objectives are to promote native woodland conservation and the creation of new native woodland uh, were part funded by the Forest Service, partly by National Parks and partly by the Heritage Council. Just an image there of a, um, a laid um, hazel hedge and um, behind it, uh, in, at the background there, there's quite an old um, hedge with uh, oak, oak ash hazel actually in it. Now the presentation uh, that I'm going to do today includes reference to the following. Um, first of all, Woodlands Ireland's interest in the hedge habitat uh, conservation. And then we look at the list of three species that are considered native to Ireland. Um, and that's from a presentation by Jenny Roach, um, National Parks that uh, she did with us in a webinar a few weeks back. Um, she'll get a link to that in the chat uh, shortly. Um, why is it important to source seed for hedge stock locally? Uh, we'll have a look at that. Uh, what is meant by provenance or origin? Just a, a basic uh, um, definition of that. Is there a broad species diversity in Irish hedge types? Uh, we'll, we'll explore that a bit. Um, what can the county hedgerow surveys that have been done up to date, the 16 of them, what can they tell us about the location of native provenance um, locally to us? Um, <clears throat> and how might planting stock issues be resolved? Because we know that there are going to be uh, shortages of stock for various schemes. So, um, Woodlands of Ireland, um, are, our interest in the hedge habitat conservation. Um, first of all, um, just, just uh, <clears throat> slightly obscured at the top of the screen there for me. Um, um, hedges are um, a form of uh, linear uh, semi-natural woodland in, in ways uh, and in other countries are interpreted, uh, other European countries, as a, a part of agroforestry, although not clearly in that mold here yet. They often provide refuge for woodland species and also they're a source of seed and cuttings, not only for um, uh, hedge stock, but also for um, native tree stock, for, for example, the native woodland scheme. Now, the, the hedge measures in CAP and also in the current reap scheme, they draw from the same pool of plant su supply as native woodland scheme measures. So this is something that we're watching carefully to and see what way can we assist in improving the supply um, for, for both agri-environment and uh, native woodland scheme measures. Now, uh, the hedgerow appraisal sy system is often referred to um, in studies of, of hedges here in Ireland. And um, that was um, uh, uh, based on a previous method by Fuchs and Murray. Um, that's uh, Neil Fuchs and Annie Murray. And um, th th then it was refined in the Technical Advisory Plan Group Woodlands Ireland into what's now known as the hedgerow appraisal system. So we've, we've been involved with that it, it back, that was 2014, and that was published. Um, also recently, and uh, currently, a hedge, sorry, Heritage Council are providing support to us for um, an experimental pro hedge project um, <clears throat> aimed at moving towards a national hedge inventory, which would be integrated into the national forest inventory. And the, the key thing there is that at the moment, the, a lot of the country hedgerow surveys are done with hedgerow appraisal system. And um, it's not in a format that can be uh, absorbed into national forest inventory. And um, if it was uh, in a uh, part of national forest inventory, then uh, we would be able to have uh, argue better about the carbon stores as well as the biodiversity and the um, the fact that we have more um, hedge um, area that, than um, virtually any other uh, country in Europe per, per, um, per square kilometer. <clears throat> so um, in, in that project, we're essentially we're looking at um, hedge plots of, uh, that are the same size as the forest plots so the two can be compared. And we're using, um, with modern technology, the um, aerial views um, and then your, your computer technology with polygon and shape files, things like that, to have the, sh the same size because of the irregular uh, shape of hedge boundaries. Um, 
and that's 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 ongoing. You, you should hear more about that during the next year. Now, one of the factors with hedges is that uh, there was talk about escaped hedges earlier on in the week. Uh, Catherine ref was referring to them on a number of occasions where they form tree lines and they can also expand out um, with bramble and so forth and then natural regeneration of, of, of species from the hedge and gradually become scrub or what other people call emergent woodland. And uh, this is something that then brings it in, uh, into uh, potentially um, native woodland conservation. There's a subsection on emergent woodland to bring that in and allow it to grow on to full woodland. <clears throat> so that is another thing that, that, that brings us into the realm of um, uh, paying attention to what's happening with the hedgerow network. Also, hedges on ancient boundaries may contain remnants of um, ancient woodland. Um, uh, there's many um, town and names uh, that are based on um, names of formal form wood, uh, towns that would have been predominantly wooded, uh, you know, dairy and quill and so forth. Now, just to uh, to give an indication of what's happening with um, actually, I have the wrong incorrect graph there. That's the native woodland conservation um, scheme uh, uh, where um, there was a it, it was a scheme that was cut in in two thousand eight and then reintroduced in two thousand fifteen, and then there was an increase, uh, um, a, a kind of a takeoff in in applications, and then. It was cut due to the the complications of the, um, the the forestry backlog. What I actually meant to put up there was the native woodland establishment figures, which is a, a similar graph, except it continues in an upward trend. So, with native woodland establishment, um, there's a strong demand for all the species that are looked for for hedge planting currently, and and that that will continue uh, in in the next number of years. I'll actually send on the native woodland establishment um, graph because it's it, it's it, instead of that drop off there, it actually continues in a, in a similar um, angle or on an upwards trajectory. So there's pressure there for for um, supply of hedging stock, and we'll, we'll come back to that again. Now this is the list of um, native species, uh, which were referred to in um, Dr. Jenny Roach's uh, uh, webinar talk. Um, that she did for with us and and also with Brian Clifford of the Forest Service um, a number of weeks ago and the uh, uh, link to that will, will come up in the chat uh, where she goes uh, in more detail um, to, to describe a, a lot of those uh, native species. So why is it important to source seed for hedge planting stock locally? Now <clears throat> this was something that was of concern to Neil Fuchs and Anne Murray when they were back in, I think it was 2005, when they were doing the Offaly County Hedgerow Survey. And things really haven't uh, changed in this regard. But um, the origin, uh, I'm sorry, I just see, can I move this box? Oh, yes. So the origin of, of, of plants or, or seeds uh, determines their adapt, adapt, adaptability, quality, and wildlife value. Now, the adaptability. Is something to do with how species um, adapt to their local environment um, over time and um, a lot of the stock we see in our hedges um, if it was certainly before 1980 if it was planted or occurred from natural regeneration is likely to be of stock that has been in the country for hundreds if not uh, if not thousands of years um, uh, I'll come back to that adaptability point in a, in a few minutes. Um, the wildlife value has been discussed in some of the other webinars during the week. Um, we'll just touch on that a little bit more as we go along. Now, a point that um, was made back at, in, in, in 2005 there was that more information is needed on the status and production capacity of the hedgerow uh, nursery sector in Ireland. And this is something we're looking at. Um, there isn't a specific list of nurseries that supply uh, native material. That's to say, let's say um, material is sourced from seed, uh, collected um, and propagated in Ireland. Uh, there, are, there is one uh, a big nursery um, who supply um, most of the, the forestry trade in the private sector, an 
and also for from the hedging point of view and there are, but there are a number of smaller operators but what we hope to do in the in the coming uh, months is to actually uh, collate a list and, and have it available on a website so that people can uh, just make it easier to find um, the limited stocks that are there um, now just uh, in relation to just a general on, on uh, the disease risk there was a, a, a statutory instrument that was announced back in July, and they gave a list of um, harmful organisms um, that uh, um, essentially that there's additional controls. And um, one of them there is, is fire blight, which affects white thorn, black thorn, and rowan. And uh, because of this, um, it, tightening up of, of plant health regulations in Europe. Um, it, it, uh, Brexit complicates things. If, for example, if you were, weren't able to source material here, it would make sense then to go to the nearest similar location, um, geographically, ecologically, which would be tend to be Britain. But uh, there's complications now with Brexit in terms of trying to import uh, material, particularly those species. Um, and um, also oak as well. Um, so um, we, uh, we did a webinar with um, Jared Catalan of Forest Service on the second webinar we did that follows the, the one that Jenny Roach and Brian Clifford were in. Um, and the, the connection to that will be um, in the chat as well. Um, and in that, uh, um, Jared Catalan uh, discusses the um, um, the issues around marketing of seed, registering seed collectors, and just the the um, everything to do with forest reproductive material, which at the moment doesn't apply um, in the in the um, hedge sector, but does apply to all um, forestry schemes, um, and and also just to do a disease to uh, check for more details on the um, Department of Agriculture Food and Marine website. So what is meant by provenance or origin? The simplest um, explanation is uh, that it's the location from which a seed, a seed lot or cuttings used to produce plant material was collected. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll go into more detail in a minute. Then, then I have the Forestry Commission um, uh, from a practice note there. And, um, it's much more um, detailed. Um, description of the same thing really um which I, I won't go into the details on that there but uh, basically it is that the location for which a seed lot are, uh, used to produce plant material was collected um now just about the provenance uh so um trees of the same species adapted to different regions of europe can bud burst or they can put out flower or seed at different times as as, as illustrated partly in this forestry commission image and you see there that they have two batches of birch seedlings um, on the left um, from uh, Norway um, and, and, and on the right from France. And the, um, the French province one has come into leaf earlier and, and the Norwegian one is, is still dormant, um, <coughs> uh, which, which could mean um, for, for insects, uh, uh, that they would be, if you had a lot of that material in, put into the mix, uh, in, in, uh, or it could be different species like Hawthorn, and the same thing could happen if you were getting stock from, uh, say, the far end of um, Bulgaria, say near the Turkish border, something like that, the nursery, and you could get cheap Hawthorn uh, and import them in. Uh, you may find um, whatever about the, the disease risk. You now they will need a plant passport, but that they will um, come into uh, the bud burst will happen at a different time, and the the flowering will happen at a different time, and the seeding will happen. And and the more of that there is, the more of a mismatch there is then for birds, mammals, and insects who have co-adapted with the local tree species here in hedges or in woodland. Um, so that, so that um, is, is one of the reasons, a key reason why, why uh, local provenance has a, has a value. Um, so is there a broad species of Ursula within hedge types around Ireland? Now, 
this is a, uh, just bear with me on this now. <clears throat> so what I've got there is um, a map uh, produced by uh, Dr. John Cross, um, formerly of, of National Parks and Wildlife Service. And essentially what it's showing is um, if the land was, was allowed to rewild, uh, what type of woodland would cover the landscape if it's left to its own devices over a period of time that I could this, this could develop in, in a just for I'm sake in a 30 to 40 year time time frame from from now if you just left things to their own devices and he uh, developed a map uh, partly from um a, a, a discordant here an indication of potential natural vegetation is obtained from remnants of some natural vegetation including hedges scattered trees uh, or shrubs so uh and, and the boundaries of vegetation units were added using maps of field boundary vegetation, um, anthrop anthropogenic grass and, and peatlands. So um, essentially, um, part of how he constructed that was based on the, um, the, the uh, hedgehog network and knowing what species are, are um, um, resident in them. Um, <clears throat> but all, just with the the the, um, the key to that map there it's um, mostly five six seven eight nine um, uh, woodland types that are in areas uh, where most of um, the uh, our hedge habitats are occurring today. Uh, so if we go back to the map there, the the brown areas for for example to be the little or no um, hedge in that area because it's a lot of um, upland and um, peatlands, and so the the um, Hedge center would occur in, in the, uh, light, the sort of lighter green area, but you can see that in some places, like in the middle there of uh, Ross Common, that's. Um, but like this, if you were to do a national um, hedgerow inventory, the pattern would come out looking something similar to what you see there um, in terms of the, the, the local variation uh, in, in your hedges. And I'll just go in, into that in more detail. So. The county hedgerow surveys have a lot of information <clears throat> um, about the location of, of uh, the, this native provenance uh, stock. Um, Joe, so just that, to remind you, you have five minutes, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah so, so Monaghan uh, was resurveyed. It was probably the first county to be resurveyed, and um, they showed um, a 10%, uh, up to a 10% loss in, in, in the hedge uh, in an 11-year period, uh, which isn't good. But the, the, these county hedgerow surveys contain data to show, showing the frequency that different trees occur at in the range of hedges look, locations across the county. So you can be very specific. In fact, in the, um, the, the, the here's an example from um, Galway compared to West Galway compared to East Galway to Calf and Ross Common. And you can see there with Hawthorne that um, the, this is the frequency of uh, the, these species occurring in the hedges that were surveyed. So, uh, for example, East Galway there, 90.3% uh, of the hedges surveyed had um, a, um, a significant amount of uh, um, hawthorn in them, where it was lo much lower in, in uh, West Galway. Um, you can see it's consistently high in Cavan and Roscommon there. And then you take Willow, there's, there's quite a bit of variation. It's, it's occurring in 50% of the hedges in West Galway, uh, but only 16.4% um, in East Galway, which is a, it's a very dry, you know, very dry ground in East Galway. Cavan then is a bit wetter. It's the the um, Mount Willow comes up, and Ross Common um, tends to be quite dry uh, for, for the most part, particularly in the southern end of the county. So there is that localized variation. You can see it there on the holly figures as well. That that's, that varies um, a bit, and and so studying these county hedgerow surveys can indicate the type of mixture, say for when you're doing filling in of hedges or uh, for for new planting, and um, you can see the broad range of species. That some of them are not native. For example, uh, fuchsia there is not is not native and is a is a bit of a spreader as well. Um, but but uh, using your native species list and then looking at what tends to occur it, it, uh, based on the county hedgerow surveys, and in fact in the in the National Biodiversity Centre they do have um, all of the um, individual hedge information from the squares where, where they do the surveys um, uh, available um, to look at, so you can get very drill down and get very specific to your local area 
as to what the head, the, the the species mix that tends to occur in your hedges, and then base your um, restock or new um, hedge for, uh, on that to, to some extent. It's a resource there to look at. So there's a bit too much detail here. Um, uh, the the First reproductive material is something that doesn't apply um, the rules of that to hedges at the moment, but it's something that should be considered to um, uh, strengthen the, the um, reduce of, of uh, disease uh, risk and that. Uh, so the possibility of using optimal species combinations and first reproductive material, which is both adapted to site conditions and genetically diverse, is often limited by what is available in nurseries. And this is from um, forest ecology and management um, uh, papers uh, that's that's um, back in 2014. But the same, the plant supply situation in Ireland is very common um, throughout uh, other states around the world, and they have the same issues as described here. And and um, just in the third paragraph there, where it refers to restoration practitioners who plan to obtain um, forest reproductive material from existing nurseries should communicate earlier with nursery managers um, to provide sufficient time for propagation of storage species. So this is, a, this is an ongoing problem that when you have schemes uh, announced that uh, the nurseries needed a two to three year lead in time to actually um, build, up the, build up the stocks. Um, so, um, you know, CAP 2023 is an opportunity for Department of Agriculture to promote sustainable hedge management. And this is, <clears throat> I'm concluding here now, uh, what's required is um, to support the native tree nursery startups and expansion of existing nurseries to, to build up the stocks um, and to provide um, training. And we can have this on, on seed, um, seed sourcing and the propagation of, of um, native tree seed. Um, to work with stakeholders to develop a code of best practice we referred to earlier on in the contractors um, discussion on, on Wednesday, we fully support that um, from the planting end to the maintenance end. Um, so the, the, the department needs to look at spreading the take up of cap hedge planting measures over several years so that nurseries can gear to meet the increased demand. So that means that you can't have everybody applying for the hedge measure all at the one go. You need to spread them out, otherwise the pressure will be on uh, to bring in imports, and that is uh, where the disease risks um, escalate. So finally, just uh, it, it is possible to learn from the native woodland process what's happened with that over the last 20 years in terms of the, um, the native woodland survey, which is a kind of inventory, and the classification of, of native woodland types, which we could also do with hedges. And then the development and management guidelines, which can be quite specific to localized conditions and um, for a diverse range of hedge types uh, that's required to be conserved. So that's what uh, Glare, that's um, the, uh, my points that I hope to make today. Thank, thanks, uh, Pat. Thanks very much, Joe. Uh, if you stop sharing, and we'll get Maria to share her presentation and, and take over. Okay, um, I'll start away then. Thank you very much for the opportunity and thanks to Joe for doing most of the introductions. Thanks a lot. Um, the species here are just an example of what we have as regards native trees and hedging stock. Uh, some of them feature in the REAP scheme. It's just to give a, a, a little sampler of some of the species that uh, we're talking about today. In terms of provenance, um, I might have a slightly different take on it than, than others, but um, I'm talking about Irish tree seeds from Irish material as far as can be possible to ascertain. So um, that's fairly self-explanatory. I hope um, Irish grown, Irish medium and not peat for obvious reasons. Uh, it would be best to keep material far away from exotic and imported material at all times while seedlings are developing. And there is a question of origin. Uh, we have muddy waters here playing the guitar for this reason. Uh, Irish tree seed is in some instances sent abroad and seedlings are later re-imported. Uh, this material can later then be called Irish origin after a time, 
but uh, it's best not to buy these plants. I'm taking a fairly hard line on uh, phytosanitary measures um, in my own life, and uh, this will surface again in the talk. Um, it may not be SIP's line or anybody else's, but it's definitely my approach. Uh, plants may be carrying pests and diseases that are hard to spot uh, when they're imported and they can damage and kill your own trees and plants and those of your neighbors. So how to tell the difference? If in doubt, leave it out and try to grow your own instead. Um, I always think back to Johnny Appleseed and the simple story of uh, eating apples and planting the seeds and leaving a woodland developing behind them or a seed orchard. Forest genetic resources is a term that's often used. And the definition from the FAO, that's the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, is uh, quite long, but the heritable materials maintained within and among trees and other woody plant species that are of actual or potential economic, environmental, scientific or societal value. And there's a, approximately just under 60,000 tree species in the world. Um, most of them have high levels of genetic diversity and offer great potential for increasing the production of both wood and non-wood forest products. So there's quite an emphasis there on economics and FAO's goal is to achieve food security for all. So uh, their, their definition reflects that and maybe doesn't uh, reflect the overall view. Uh, when it comes to Irish forest genetic resources, we don't have genomic data for Irish trees, um, nor do we really understand the Irish tree species genomics. We, uh, there are a hu huge number of other species associated with Irish trees uh, over and underground, and we don't understand them either. When we talk about phenotypic variation in trees and plants, we just mean what we can see. So in that sense, we're dealing with uh, form and height and general fitness in the same way that Mendel, the monk and his peas, there's a poem to go with that, um, did his studies. It's a little bit beyond that, but we're, we're not very far beyond that level. When it comes to comparisons then of genomic information, uh, Peduncolato Quercus rober has 12 chromosome pairs. Uh, so that's um, yeah, double in, in the case of chromosomes, obviously, and 26,000 genes and 750 million base pairs. So if you think you have 900 or so base pair information um, or up to um, 3,000 base pairs, you know, you're, you're not really knowing very much about the overall um, genetic information for an oak tree. Uh, humans then, for comparison, with 23 chromosome pairs, uh, 20,000 genes and 3 billion base pairs. But lob lolly pine surprised everybody. It's slightly modified now, but 24 chromosome pairs, 23 billion base pairs. It's an absolutely huge um, genetic uh, resource and uh, is, is being unwrapped. But the problem is that we don't really know how to interpret most of this information. Just to put a plug in for uh, traditional knowledge, uh, Tree la he Hedge Laying Association uh, of Ireland is, uh, has always been doing stalwart work and learning as they go about how to manage hedges in Ireland and are really helpful in everything they do. Also, there's the development of what I would term the slow hedgerow movement, uh, the don't mow, let it grow idea. Um, and here people are working with sides at Ballymoney Riverside Park, Northern Ireland. In forensic science, there is a term, uh, remember that every contact leaves a trace. This was coined by Edmund Lockhart, really the first major forensic scientist, a Frenchman. Uh, just uh, the image on the other side there showing an extreme form of contact. On the plant health risk side, uh, that's really what I'm talking about today. Uh, we're dealing with things at the moment that uh, include insects, aphids, weevils, beetles. Uh, we have things like uh, slugs, nematode worms, um, real worms and spiders. Uh, moths, the oak processionary moth, and has arrived in Ireland and has been controlled. But um, it 
it poses a human health hazard as well. So that's sometimes why some of these uh, challenges are met more seriously. I would consider a heterohelix uh, an invasive species on trees because um, it really does cover up an awful lot of epiphytic species that are there, over 300 epiphytes, and some of them in major threat from heterohelix cover. Uh, the fungi then that we deal with at the moment already in Ireland are Hymenocyphus fraxinius, the ash dieback, Phytophthora remorum, uh, chestnut blight, Gibberella circinata, and bacteria fire blight was mentioned earlier, Erwinia amylophora. But there are viruses too that are very hard to spot and uh, it's a huge challenge to, to get these things as they come in. Uh, the EU list of priority pests um, was released there in 2019. Um, just to draw your attention to two there in um, bold font, Agrillus planipenis, sorry, uh, the emerald ash borer beetle. It's very cute and very dangerous. It, it kind of uh, takes over ash trees that are already suffering from ash dieback and really finishes them off. And then the big one at the moment is a bacterium xylella fastidiosa. It uh, can infect hundreds of species of plants and trees. Are we looking at the last March of the ends? It's a bit dramatic, but we uh, know that about 30 percent of tree species around the world are threatened with extinction. Some of those are quite rare in nature, but at least 142 tree species are recorded as extinct by uh, BGCI. So the main threats to tree species are forest clearance, forms of habitat loss, uh, other than that, and then exploitation for timber, other products, and the spread of disease and pests. If you suspect that you have a novel species of disease or pest in your hedgerow or trees and plants, um, please do go ahead and contact the Horticulture and Plant Health Division or the Department of Agriculture at Johnstown Castle. Uh, just in the top uh, corner there, there's the emerald ash borer. We're really watching out for that. And then um, Led Zeppelin aren't likely to show up in your hedgerow, unfortunately, or fortunately, as you might see fit. Um, just the driver of this is world trade. You could shorthand that for greed, potentially. I mean, some of these products are obviously very necessary, but some are deeply not and are being carted around the world to give us all these very comfortable lives but um, there is a major drawback at the other side. So we can see the lines going up and up and up, um, up to 2020, where things did pull, pull back a little bit, but um, there's some great papers out there, one being mentioned there at the bottom, unwelcome exchange, a lot of inconvenient truths for us to deal with in our daily lives. So the value of hedgerows and hedgerow native trees and plants, um, obviously trade, agriculture, horticulture, forestry, tourism, uh, to some extent, all of these things interact and there are imports and exports around the plants and trees that we are included in our hedgerows that are also part of our native woodland species. Inherent value for hedgerow sake, you're dealing with a living habitat and all of the species that live and interact with that. Uh, what hedgerows and trees and plants in them have ever done for us? Well, there's a whole list of uh, ecosystem services there and things that they do to clean air, to uh, sequester carbon, to flood mitigate and give soil security, as well as shelter and boundaries. Um, the hedgerow species themselves are priceless and you can't get them back once they're gone. So the cost of not protecting our, our trees and plants, uh, as said before, we have 689,000 kilometres of hedgerows in Ireland, hopefully still. Uh, ash is our most common hedgerow tree and our most common tree in Ireland. So uh, the loss of ash and the dealing with ash dieback, Hymenocyphus fraxinius, is approximated at 14 billion euros not to be sniffed at and a very, very, very serious problem for us all. Um, add to that the suffering death and potential extinction of dependent species, birds, animals, fungi, algae, that includes the lichenized fungi, of course, the algae, uh, liverworts and mosses, and then the current, um, the loss and mitigation required 
where all the other diseases and pests currently attacking Irish trees and plants and the ones on the way. So a New Zealand flatworm is a big, ugly thing to, to consider, uh, as opposed to some of the very cryptic species that I consider, um, the, the fungi and some of the viruses. So uh, this New Zealand flatworm came into Ireland um, among a couple of other countries. It's thought to have traveled in, in potted plants um, and then um, moved around the country quite successfully. Uh, trajectories of introduced plant health threats kind of mirror what human health issues, but there are no hospitals for plants, unfortunately. So ports, airports, botanic gardens, nurseries, major infrastructure plantings and private gardens, and then things move out into the wider countryside. But that's generally some of the trajectory can overlap there, but that's generally it internationally. Um, just to lighten the mood a little, would you rather be Tina in Mad Max 3 or Aretha with a lot of self-respect and respect for the environment around us and all of the creatures that depend on hedgerows and hedgerow plants? I know where I'd rather be. What can we do for our Irish hedgerow trees and plants? and their health. Um, I suppose the main thing is to keep it clean. There's some fairly radical ideas here, but growing your own hedgerow trees from your own healthy, robust material in your, in your own fields and in your immediate area, teaching your children and friends about seeds and nature and all of the fun you can have while doing that. Uh, those are the precious memories and those are the things that children and the next generations will take forward. If you have to buy in, purchase local material as much as possible and from extremely re reputable sources with their excellence, photos, phytosanitation measures in place. Uh, don't buy anything that doesn't come from Irish seeds or cuttings that has been grown in Ireland. I know some people will find that awfully hard to take, but it is just my opinion. Um, trim hedgerows lightly and only where and when necessary. I know there are lots of regulations around hedgerow management, um, but the lighter touch is, is the best. Um, managing ivy, cut it where possible. There's plenty of it around. We won't make it locally extinct. It's, it's just tearing through things and it's making trees very top heavy. Sterilizing of cutting equipment as much as you can, vehicles, wheels, footwear, washing clothes and ourselves after we deal with plants in and managing hedgerows, especially if we're cutting things. We can spread disease by cutting equipment. Just to show a, a little experiment that was done that shows the, the harm we can do inadvertently. Dirty boots rinsed with water boots in the by two by two by two and then disinfected boots the third set um, then these were swabbed onto petri dish plates and you can see the results there hopefully at the end so this was an experiment done in the university of ghent it's very obvious the uh, consequences um, and of course if you have a chance and you're interested at all please consider joining the society of irish plant pathologists uh, there are autumn and spring meetings and there are get-togethers uh, showcasing irish research on plant health and pathology uh, it's really really cheap as well so <laughs> just if you're that way inclined we'd really welcome more members and please consider following us on twitter as well at sip pathologists thank you very much Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, well, if it's as, if you generate as much fun in those meetings as, as you're as you're doing here, they, they should be very attractive. Um, I suppose on a on a, a serious note, uh, we I suppose nobody needs to be told about the the uh, risk of uh, uh, diseases at the moment in what we've lived through for the last uh, uh, two years in relation to humans, but. How seriously do you rate the threat to a, a, a significant variety of, of our species from what's happened to ash and what previously happened to almond? Uh, is it a really, really big threat to our, a, a big number of our species? I think all of us, uh, I don't know where we all are in Ireland, but if we look out the window, we can see that uh, European uh, legislation and the policing of that and, and and that hats off to anybody working on plant health in Ireland but um, things are not working out if 
uh, one of the issues I think was pointed out to me recently by Chair Callan and was very important is that when it comes to human health, like COVID-19, and we've all learned an awful lot more about diseases and spread because of it, that was one of the few upsides of it. Um, but that legislation um, for human health and for animal health in the case of foot and mouth, that legislation is at national level. We can shut the borders if we need to, if we feel that's right. But for plant health, that is an EU decision. So that isn't uh, in our hands to do that. And um, that is one of the bigger issues. We can, we can argue for that. And I think we should, especially with island status and for islands around Europe. But if something comes into uh, um, Europe as a disease or a pest, it's basically, it could be anywhere in the EU. And it doesn't matter where it comes into, it's as if it's, it's everywhere already. So there, it's, it's not quite as bad as that, but it's quite limited what we can do to fight something in the plant um, pathology side. And the other thing is we don't have many solutions. We don't have vaccines. We don't have much understanding of how plants can recover from and how we can help them recover from these we're just throwing too much at them all at once in the last just to remind everyone if you have questions for joe or maria just put them in the q a catherine number of questions in already yeah and uh, i'm going to group some of the, the four or five or six species ones and joe i'm going to comment on the the simple ones and let you focus on the, 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 the two I want, um, because we want, I try and get through them. So if we could keep the answers really brief, just uh, unless you disagree with me, I'm confirming the Catoni Aster is not native. Uh, white thorn missing from the list is, is down as probably Hawthorn. We're back to the reason why we have Latin yeah. names and Cotegus Monogaiga. So um, white thorn farmers use um, ecologists or maybe from books from, from old would tend to be white Hawthorn. So I suppose we should use both all the time for white thorn when we're talking to farmers. Uh, Rowan, is an, or, uh, Rowan is mountain ash, but it is different to ash, so it's not subject to ash dieback. Now, the questions, um, Joe, two mm -hmm. questions. Where does pear occur in Ireland in the wild? And secondly, can you comment on Rosa rugosa? It's one I'm interested in your both your answers or whoever wants to take it. The confusion because it's sold in edible hedging mixes and it's also listed as an invasive. So the pear and the ro Rosa rugosa, Joe. Um, <clears throat> um, I, I don't know any exact locations of where um, wild pear uh, occurs, but I would say that um, National Parks and Wildlife Service uh, staff, uh, particularly um, an inquiry to um, Dr. Jenny Roach, in, a woodland ecologist in National Parks, that uh, they will have um, uh, maps uh, uh, that show um, uh, localized squares, you know, two kilometer squares, and somewhere in there that it'll be, have been recorded uh, of um, uh, wild pear. Uh, but I don't know any precise locations. And sometimes, because when you have rare species like um, uh, white beam, it's on, on Jenny's list, there was a number of white beams uh, types, and some of those are quite rare, and um, you, you do require a permit from National Parks to collect because they're concerned about damage uh, to uh, the, uh, the remaining stock. Some of them are quite close to extinction. Rosa um, Rebolta. Yeah, uh, well, Rosa Rugosa, I don't think is is on is on the um, the list, but no. but of, of the sort of bramble um, uh, no, species. The, the query, Joe, that I know I know yeah. one I'm to, is 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 it good or bad? Is it invasive or is it something we should be selling as an edible? And maybe Maria wants to come in there, but go ahead, Joe. Yeah, no, I haven't observed it myself as it, you know in in situ uh, in a situation of being um, uh, um, invasive. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say it, it, it isn't. Um, I, I would defer to, um, again, to uh, particularly um, national parks on that. Uh, but if it's not on that list that I've showed you earlier, then it's not a native species, essentially. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree there. Maria, do you want to comment on, on that one? Yeah, I think uh, Rosa rugosa is, is a bit garden escape as well, but it, it can be. Um, it's one of those, uh, Declan Dude did a lot of work on Rosa in hedgerows, and it, it's definitely not a bad thing to have in a hedgerow. Um, but pear, uh, I, we did note um, in, on Bear Island, pear as a garden escape 
even around the fortifications on Bear Island. So occasionally pear will jump across the hedge and get going a little bit as well, but it wouldn't be in any way invasive or obviously. Okay, and just a final one on, on Ivy questions. And I don't think I'm myself and Maria are disagreeing. Maria may be a bit stronger on it. Um, I, I, while I will both say it's the top heaviness rather than interfering with the, the mm. tree. And um, I would just be saying, think of all the other species. This is my point about we can't just think of one thing, but I don't think we're too far aligned on, on that one. You know, you have to make a considered decision rather than saying all oh, Ivy must go. Um, just come back now, I want to get through a few questions here. Um, biodiversity uh, equivalence of old, an old 200, 2000 year old hedge versus a newly planted one. No yeah. contest. Uh, from an epiphyte point of view, um, uh, that's why offsetting doesn't work. Because if you, even if you plant your new hedge before you take out the other one, you're talking about years before the new hedge will start inheriting the species from the old hedge before you remove it. Are it's we talking hundreds? Incredibly important to get that point across that you it's not replacing uh, like with like. It's really, um, it's, it's not even that it'll take you a hundred years to get back to where you were. It, it's now impossible for some species to come back to that hedge because they're too far gone in terms of their uh, removal from the landscape, their the harm to them from pollution and just physical removal so that they will not refine that hedge again or they're extinct already. Okay, Joe, so, are you just... differentiating between native and local and then you may want to come back on that one as well. Are you differentiating between native versus local? Uh, uh, no, uh, I mean, um, your native species are ones that have um, to, uh, colonized here uh, after the last ice age and have been continuously um, adapting to the climate and uh, conditions here uh, over that uh, uh, thousands of years. And then you have more recently introduced uh, species, to, for example, beech. Um, you know, uh, was introduced maybe in the med late medieval period or, or, or uh, maybe Tudor or, or um, 17th century even. Sycamores may have come in a bit earlier, possibly in Norman times. Uh, it's, uh, nobody's exactly um, um, sure on those on those things. Um, but I think, they, you know, is, 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 you know, you start off, there was the word local there. Um, are, yeah. Would you recommend local, only no. sticking to local or are we OK with anything that's native to Ireland? When, when I say local, I mean the island. OK, OK. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When, they, when they talk about um, um, the, the um, uh, provenance um, and um, the, our Ireland as a unit is, is considered to be one seed source as an island itself. Um, geographically, and that includes Northern Ireland as well, of course. Yeah. And of course, any plant health um, measures that we take, we need to coordinate with Northern Ireland authorities so that it operates on an all island basis. That's very clear. That's great. And just, I suppose, you are, you are making the point about consider what's growing locally from the hedgerow service. But you can, yes. yeah, yeah, but that's a slightly different yeah, angle. No, that's, that's yes, clear. yeah. So in in the um the lo the your local uh, county hedgerow surveys um and some of them are half counties west or, or or east of Galway, for example, um you can see what uh, the um species mixture is more localized to to a particular farming area. Okay, thanks. And Joe. that should help in in selecting species for restock and 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 also to. Uh, where to collect seed from as well. And just that, that there would be local effects like the geology, the soil, mm. the phenology locally as well, which varies a little bit. I, I know from the fungi um, days uh, rather than weeks, kind of you know, in the mix um, across the island, but those local um, pockets and local uh, conditions really do uh, over time. Uh, give local material an edge over introduced material, even if they initially have an advantage in trials that usually uh, wears off after, after some time.
Okay, thank you. Look, we're coming to an end and Pat, I'm coming back to you, but I just have two more comments because uh, you may have spotted some more later questions. Uh, just again, I can confirm the county surveys are not annual or regular or not even been done in all the counties. Yeah. It's very haphazard. Fantastic yeah. example of Monaghan there repeating one during the week. And last yeah. question from me um, for both of you, possibly, which is the nub of what are we're talking about today. Any suggestions for actions for the domestic nursery sector, which is in decline? Uh, sorry, repeat again. Uh, how could we help? Any have you any suggestions for actions for the domestic nursery sector? How yeah, uh, um, it, it is something that the um, Department of Agriculture and Chagas, in particular, can assist in um, developing training. Um, in this case, specific to um, native species, so that we can increase the volume of material available. But it is going to take. Um, several years there are a number of small startups at the moment um in uh, you know in county clare and also i, I know it, we've got to take an all-island perspective here for example ulster wildlife trust will be starting a new nursery next year there there is uh, northern Ireland conservation volunteers um we will be uh, with our, we're, we're going to upgrade our website we'll have um information on that we'll keep adding on any new information we can help to assist in terms of training that might be happening and uh, networking of seed collectors or I guess people in the nursery business to meet together and coordinate their efforts as well. And just there are resources like this, uh, the, our trees, and now you can download that from our website. It's very good if you're going, if you decide to go into seed collection, collection or pr plant propagation in a, in a small way. And I just, again, there's resources on the uh, uh, TCV um, uh, website that's it's the conservation volunteers which is northern Ireland conservation volunteers there's a couple of downloads there that are very useful in terms of getting started on seed collection and propagating plants um, uh, so I'd advise uh, we, we'll put up links on that on our on our um, new website as we go or you can contact and we can we can send you those if you can't get them by by googling it Small and local is beautiful, I think, but also the fact that um, the nursery sector needs to be uh, consulted with in advance of any announcements for uh, grant schemes for tree planting. If, if those trees or seedlings aren't there or coming on stream, uh, it forces imports or it forces uh, practices that don't benefit anybody in the country and definitely not the trees or plant health. Yeah, I've taken a, a, a few messages there that are, are, are aimed at, at uh, our policymakers. One is, is to plan ahead and make sure that, that the entire movement that is required here uh, works together. I suppose just to, to, to finish, there is a lot of work going on at the moment by our, our policymakers in terms of preparing for CAP 2023. Uh, you've mentioned a couple of things. Are there any final messages that either of you would like to to, to send to to our policymakers? Um, well, the, the, the for me the key thing is to um, plan out how um, farmers who wish to take up the hedge measures uh, can be spread over the time, so that the nurseries can um, successfully gear up because the seed will need to be collected. Uh, they need to know what volume to collect of individual species next uh, autumn and, and into the winter. And then um, to, to get the volumes right so that we can um, focus mainly on our own indigenous uh, native stock um, and, and just uh, and improve our, our plant health, health situation because there are a lot of risks out there and uh, we have to do everything we can to reduce those risks rather than just leaving the door open and saying, oh, there's nothing we can do. Uh, let's just uh, let, have a free for all. And I don't know where to start. Uh, one more funding, please, for uh, all kinds of plant health in Ireland. Um, these people like Derek Callan and James Choisel and people, they, they need more money to, to do this, to, to run around and check everything coming into the country and proper quarantining needs to be devised. 
Um, the other thing would be there the hedge layers, there are people like Joe and, and Woodlands of Ireland, there's the Organic Centre, there are so many groups around the country who have uh, learned how to manage plants and trees and work with them to, to help humans get what they need as well. And um, sometimes you feel that uh, the people who have put in the most time are nearly being bypassed um, for some strange reason by the powers that be. There, there's great resources and they're great people in Ireland and great knowledge and just use what's there in the training that's required in rolling this out and helping people do the right things that they want to do anyway I think in their heart and souls they they know what's right it's just facilitating that really okay thanks very much Thank we, we need to leave it there I would like to congratulate everybody who has been involved in uh, Hedgerow Week led by by Catherine I think a great resource once again uh, which will be available for anybody who wants to, to look back on it, uh, all the presentations, uh, the videos from the week and, and all the, the, the webinars uh, will be available. In particular, I'd like to thank Yvonne Marr, who did Trojan work in making sure that the whole thing uh, hung together. And there were a few fairly hairy moments, I think, during the week. So uh, Yvonne showed her metal dur during those. So thank you very much. To our series producer, uh, Andy Boland, uh, from the, the, the Signpost series, again, thanks very much for, for, for all your work. And uh, uh, hopefully we will see you next week for, for our final webinar of the, of the year. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk Signpost series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review, and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson, and thanks for listening.